All right, thank you all. Um, this is a, a really interesting set of results that just kind of naturally drops out of this kind of really high resolution convection permitting studies uh, simulations. Um, and this is obviously work done with a, a large number of people helping out. I couldn't have done this all by myself if I'd wanted to. Um, and we're, again, looking at changes in hurricanes and similar to Dr. Takayaba's approach, using the pseudo-global warming approach to look at changes in existing hurricanes. And I probably don't have to tell people in the room too much about why this might be important, right? Hurricanes are responsible for tremendous amount of damage. If you look through the, the list of the most the sort of costliest hurricanes, you see, look at the dates here, um, and you notice that a large number of them have occurred in the last 10, 20 years. And this is a combination of factors, right? This isn't just climate change. This is also due to increased urbanization along the shoreline and exposure to these elements. But there is potentially a component of climate change in this signal as well. I'd also point out that a lot of these, the, the most expensive hurricanes here, it's not the winds that are causing the damage. We think of the strong winds associated with hurricanes, but it's often the flooding through a combination of intense precipitation as well as storm surge that causes most of the damage. So understanding the potential changes in precipitation coming out of these as well as potential changes in wind and storm surge becomes really important. And this setup is a similar setup to what we've seen, in fact, exactly the same setup as what we've seen in a few talks already where we ran the uh, wharf at a four kilometer convection permitting resolution, uh, at least grid spacing, over the domain you see on the right hand side here. So we're re well resolving the mountains and beginning to resolve convection in these simulations. Um, one of the important parts to consider when you think about trying to simulate hurricanes is that a lot of hurricanes in this region are gonna come in through this southern border or eastern border. These aren't spinning up internally in the domain, although some of that occurs as well. But because the boundary for the simulation crosses the tracks of most of the major hurricanes, we're able to essentially initialize the hurricanes through the boundary conditions. Now, there are probably pros and cons to that, but it's something to keep in mind in these simulations is that because they come through this, we're able to essentially force the exact same hurricanes to occur in these simulations that occurred in reality. And then I'll also get to this PGW approach where we also ran a, a pseudo-global warming set of simulations. Uh, so we have our current climate simulations with 13 years of four kilometer convection permitting simulations over this domain. And then we opposed, imposed a pseudo-global warming signal to this where we warmed the air by about three to four degrees Celsius kept relative humidity roughly constant, um, and modified the, the background winds as well to, to correspond with the average change coming out of 19 global climate models. And I think Roy showed a, a similar animation to this earlier. So this is what these simulations look like. And you can see the hurricanes coming across. This was Hurricane Ivan in 2004. I think this is going to repeat. But you'll see this storm system kind of spinning up as it comes in through the bottom boundary. And then after it's left, just a little ways away from the boundary, it's able to spin up its own internal dynamics to really form this storm as it occurred. Um, whereas when it's right on the boundary, that's obviously not what it looked like because it keeps interacting with this boundary condition as the, the winds are circling through the domain. And so this is a problem for some of the simulations but I, we're going to focus on the, the storms that end up being pretty well simulated. And to just get a sense of how well these simulations did in, in comparing the simulations of tropical cyclones, hurricanes in this domain, um, to the observations, here I'm showing the tracks. So this doesn't show intensity at all. It's just the track location of the storms in current climate, in blue coming out of wharf, and this green dashed line is the observed track from the HERDAT database. And a few things to point out here. First is that, by and large, these follow really closely. You know, when they're right on top of each other like this, it's hard to even distinguish the two lines. Another thing you'll notice is that often the green lines continue. And this is probably primarily an artifact of the tracking algorithm, where if I just change some of the thresholds to allow it to continue tracking at lower pressures, 
it would have, but because I was focused on the hurricane phase of these uh, storms, I set a, a relatively high uh, set of thresholds to continue tracking these. Uh, so it's not that Wharf doesn't have a storm that keeps moving in this direction. It's just no longer in the tracking algorithm. Uh, the second is that, again, most of these you see the green dots crossing the boundary because these are coming in through the boundaries of the domain. Um, and then the blue line doesn't pick up until a little further in. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Again, some of it is just the tracking algorithm. And if you tweak some of the thresholds, it might start tracking them earlier. Uh, but importantly, in a lot of cases, the storm simply needs some time to spin up within the, the numerical simulation. So the boundary conditions are coming from era interim, which with something like a 70 plus kilometer grid spacing really doesn't resolve these storms. It's just imposing the large scale structure for this, these tropical cyclones. And then WARF has to spin up its own internal dynamics to track these. And then you do see a few storms where the, the tracks diverge a little bit um, this is probably one of the, the greatest divergences right here, with Hurricane Rita. Uh, most of them really do a good job of sticking right on top of each other. And that's important because the sea surface temperatures in these runs are all prescribed. And so if the hurricanes in the simulation deviate too far from where they were in reality, that means that the model is using potentially much warmer sea surface temperatures than it should. Because in reality, the hurricane's mixing that top layer of the ocean and cooling it down some. So when you have these hurricanes run off over sea surface temperatures that didn't actually have a hurricane on top of them, the model gets too much moisture coming off of a, the ocean, ends up with too extreme hurricane potentially. Um, now I'll, I'll get to some of the intensity simulations later, or some of the, the comparisons. These intensities do look reasonable. The wind speeds in the simulations don't ever get quite as strong as is observed. Uh, but the central pressures are, are pretty reasonable compared to our best observations. So this is a, an example showing um, the direct comparison of Hurricane Ivan in current future, current climate on the left and future PGW climate on the right. And so one thing you note is simply that the blues, which is water vapor, are much darker on the PGW side because there's simply more moisture in the atmosphere. But then you can also track the storm dynamics. They follow the exact same track in current and future, or very nearly so. Um, but you notice the greens and reds, which is the precipitation coming out of the model, are quite a bit more intense. You see this again spinning up here. More intense in the future simulation than in the current simulation. You can also sort of imagine that maybe the radius is a little bit tighter. The winds are a little bit faster. Um, but that turns out to be a much harder thing to quantify. So I'm going to show some of the, uh, the changes in a more statistical sense in a minute. Um, this is, again, just showing some of the uh, intensities. So this is comparing the observed intensities. So this is color coded by maximum wind speed. And then the size of the circles corresponds to approximately the size of the, the radius of maximum winds. Um, and then similar, similar circles and color codings in the wharf simulations. And what you do see is that some of the storms, so for example, Hurricane Gustav is a little bit too weak in wharf. You also note that it doesn't really spin up, as I mentioned before, until it gets into the model domain a little further, where in reality, the hurricane came across and was already a hurricane strength further south in the Caribbean. In contrast, Hurricane Ike comes across and ends up getting stronger in the wharf simulation than it was in observations. Though you do see similar patterns where in both Wharf and the observations, the storm is much weaker over Cuba, where it's interacting with the land. And then it intensifies as it comes, off of the, comes over the Gulf of Mexico and feeds off of the warmer waters over there. And then, of course, dies down as soon as it hits land again. Um, so some of the simulations, you end up with a hurricane that's a little bit too strong in Wharf. Some of the simulations, you end up with a hurricane that's a little bit too weak. Uh, but importantly, we're able to simulate the current and PGW. We're simulating the exact same storm. So maybe we have a little bit more faith in the changes that are going to occur in these, although it's, it's something to be cautious of. And if you look at more average statistics over a large number of storms, here I'm again just showing you 
two storms with a number of statistics. So here you see Hurricane Ernesto, which started off with about a 52 kilometer average radius um, and increased to about a 75 kilometer average radius. This shows you a fairly large increase in the storm size. The maximum wind speed, so this is the average maximum wind speed along the entire track. This isn't an instantaneous maximum. Um, so obviously it's below hurricane force here, but that's because we're averaging in a lot of time periods where it's really just a tropical so storm as well. Um, you see actually a slight decrease in the maximum wind speeds in Ernesto, a huge increase in the maximum rainfall rates, and a slight decrease in the translation speed, so just how fast this hurricane is moving through the world. In contrast, you look at Hurricane Ophelia, and you see actually almost the opposite signal in some of these. So here you're getting a very slight decrease in storm size, probably not significant, statistically significant. An increase in the maximum wind speed simulated. Again, a large increase in maximum rainfall rates. And in this case, a slight increase in translation speed, just the forward motion of the storm. So we see different storms. And if you look across the entire 22 storms that we simulated in current and future climate, you consistently see a, just a variety of changes where the storm size in some of them increases, some of them decreases, wind speed, some of them it increases, some of them it decreases. Um, there's a little bit more of a consistent increase in the maximum wind speeds. And it's statistically significant, but how real that is is a little bit hard to say. But all of the storms showed a really large increase in rainfall rates. This is consistent in every single storm, and it's not too hard to understand because one of the primary changes we're doing in this PGW simulation is simply adding moisture to the boundaries. And all of the changes in wind speed has to come from the dynamics in the model where that increased moisture leads to an increased latent heat and feeds the, the sort of heat engine. Um, the translation speeds are largely changing due to the background circulation changes that were imposed because the global models have very small tendencies in their sort of changes in circulation of a large scale. And the way that's imposed in the PGW simulation may or may not be quite the right change, but it's something to consider as we're doing simulations like PGW simulations is, does it make any sense to average a global circulation, you know, even regionally, average the circulation over months and months, and then apply that small delta to the wind fields at every point in time? Um, as I mentioned, once you average all of these hurricanes together, there's some very small changes in maximum wind speeds, storm size, but again, a very consistent increase in the maximum rainfall rates. So this follows on with the issue of trying to understand uh, flooding and inland flooding in the future, where well, we may or may not know changes in hurricane wind speeds. It's very clear that uh, precipitation coming out of these should increase, particularly maximum precipitation rates. Um, and when we look in a little bit more detail, this is now taking every single point in all of the tracks from all 22 of these simulations and plotting up their maximum precipitation rates um, as a histogram in, from current climate in blue and the PGW climate in orange. And what you see again is not just a shift, but a, a really big increase in the, uh, I guess that's essentially a shift. You do have a small decrease here. here. Um, a really strong increase in maximum precipitation rates where you're getting 250 millimeters an hour. Uh, this is that four kilometer resolution where it's just permitting convection. It's not resolving it perfectly. So it may be over uh, predicting some of the most extreme precipitation events. Um, and then if we also look at maximum wind speeds, even though the average change across this is only barely statistically significant, when you look at the most extreme wind speeds, you see a very clear increase. So there's a, many more um, periods where you're hitting faster wind speeds. But I also want to point out this dashed line. This dashed line is about what a Cat 4 hurricane needs. Uh, so none of these simulations, even the PGW period, is really getting the maximum wind speeds that we see in reality. So we do have a number of Cat 5 hurricanes in this database of 22 storms we simulated. But WARF isn't able to get wind speeds that strong. Um, this is potentially because of the way it's coupled to the ocean, or not coupled to the ocean, which may be part of the problem. Um, 
where it's effectively not limiting the roughness that it's able to churn up on the water. And so it's getting waves. You know, It doesn't actually have waves, but the effect of those waves that may be too strong in the model, the faster the winds go, the faster its roughness length of the surface, the, the larger the roughness length of the surface gets. And therefore, the more it limits the wind speeds, whereas in reality, these waves start breaking more, and you, you don't build up as large waves as the model may sort of be simulating. So it's something to consider when you're simulating something like tropical cyclones is really thinking about the connection between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, obviously, because we're not coupling to the ocean, we're not getting changes in the, the cold wake effect as a hurricane moves over the ocean as well. So there's potential issues in how that's done. Um, and I'd also point out that there are a number of storms that were actually hard to simulate. So of course, everybody wants to know about their favorite hurricane. And Katrina is one that comes up a lot. Katrina was actually one that was not simulated very well with this model setup for a, a couple of reasons. Um, but part of it is that it um, sort of bumps along the bottom boundary. And so it keeps interacting with those 70 kilometer grid spacing of the ear interim uh, data set. And it's not clear that it's ever able to really spin up properly as a result. It also initializes the, the storm forms pretty much inside the wharf domain. So the, the genesis of the storm isn't strongly forced by the boundary conditions. So what you see here is this kind of very loosely connected rings of convection here. So there is some um, something of a hurricane. And you'll see it spin up here. So you, you're just seeing it in the precipitation here, unfortunately. You see this ring. And then as it moves away from the boundary, it starts to coalesce and form a hurricane, um, form what we would traditionally think of as Katrina. But if you look at that, storm, that track again, you notice that it doesn't cross over New Orleans. It crosses a little bit further. It may even hit the panhandle of Florida. And so it's really not simulating the right storm. It's not going over the right part of the ocean. It's not clear that it's, it's fair to compare this. So the, the storms like this that really didn't compare well with their historical simulation or that changed their location significantly in the future, we didn't include in our analysis of trying to understand changes. Because really what you're looking at is more of the chaotic variability and where the storm happened to end up. Um, another example was Hurricane Charlie, where it essentially didn't form in these at all. So here's the, the track from Hurricane Katrina um, and intensities and the simulations in Wharf, which, like I said, it just couldn't spin up a simulation, a, a hurricane earlier. Hurricane Charlie, there's nothing at all in Wharf. Um, and you, you look at those water vapor animations, and there's just there's nothing there. Um, what you'll notice if you look at the observed track for Charlie is that, A, these dots are really spread out. You know, Compare here, where I forget if these are three hourly points in time, um, but they're, they're pretty close together. So this storm isn't moving all that fast. Charlie was a really fast moving hurricane. It came across the boundary conditions in essentially one forcing time step. Um, and in fact, area interim's boundary conditions right there had almost nothing resembling a storm. It was incredibly weak at that exact point in time. The, the boundary conditions, had the model domain been up here, it probably would have simulated Charlie. But where it happened to be, the, con the atmospheric conditions just weren't conducive to the generation of a storm. So there are issues with using this sort of boundary conditions to initialize hurricanes and something to be cautious of. But for other storms, it, it appears to be giving us a lot of information. So just to, to wrap up. I think it's, it's impressive to me how well these wharf simulations did simulate a lot of the hurricanes. Um, I should point out that these wharf simulations weren't set up to simulate hurricanes. They were set up to look at the, the water cycle over the entire US. And so the fact that it did this without our even trying was, was kind of cool. Um, and just speaks to the number of things, the amount of detail that's in these convection permitting simulations just inherently. Um, Using this PGW method allows us to look at some of the detailed changes. We do see a fairly clear, consistent increase in precipitation that I think is reliable. 
The other changes in these simulations I'm not as convinced by. It, ju it just needs more work to understand the physics, to understand how confident we can be in some of these changes. But the consistent increases in maximum precipitation rates by something like 20% is, is a very clear result from this study. Um, and then the final point is just that no two storms are alike. Some of them increased maximum wind speeds, some of them decreased maximum wind speeds. And so as we're trying to understand future potential changes, it's important to simulate a large library of storms, not to look at one storm in too much detail. Thank you.